thank you for uh, inviting me to talk about the interesting and important topic about FFT. Uh, so to make a clear disclaimer, first of all, I'm not the ex FFT expert, but as uh, Ray indicated, I'm an application uh, developers and enabling uh, uh, engineer, which means that using, you know, thinking about how to FF use FFT uh, well so that we can increase the productivity of each application. So the angle will be about, you know, we have FFT libraries and all sorts of tools we have and how we would be able to use it in particular on the many and multi-core systems we have. Because as you know, like a KNL or even Z on a Skylake of the late uh, generation has really many cores. So it's very difficult to consider a very single core uh, aspect of FFT and try to uh, do the application development. So I want to discuss how what to consider uh, in, regarding FFT on the current platform. So the agenda of today is a very, uh, uh, I will follow the flow of it, introducing you or remind you about the discrete Fourier transform and how it is being used in application and some uh, 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 numerical aspect of it and computations of uh, most common te uh, technique to perform discrete Fourier transform, namely fast Fourier transformation. And I will introduce the, the uh, widely used library FFTW and MKLDFT to see what options you have and how you will be using it in the uh, on the Intel platform. And I will use a uh, specific application classes, uh, namely the quantum simulations based on plane wave uh, basis set, uh, to bring up the issues we have to consider not just to the FFT, but you know, something that you will be considering in any application development in the context of a 3D FFT of the particular class of application. And I will summarize. Uh, please uh, send me any <laughs> questions and interrupt me if you have any uh, questions during the session. The discrete Fourier transformation is, a, it, it's, I guess that the original uh, idea is expressed on the right panel of the, uh, uh, the slide. So we, I mean, in nature, we have a, a lot of information, let's say signal in the real time. So the axis, x axis is time, that we are getting some signals from it. But how would you interpret this very random information? It turned out using the discrete free transformation or in the infinite series of it, we can transform the time series into the frequency domain. And then we can see a very interesting feature. In this case, we are looking at two particular peaks and that is captured of the seemingly random uh, signal. But in, so this is the property we are going to use in many applications. But because we are uh, transforming uh, the infinite uh, degrees of freedom problem into a uh, periodic uh, signals that will be a loss of information, but nevertheless, the key characteristic, uh, key property we want to capture will be uh, 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 maintained. So that's what the FFT or discrete uh, free transform will do. So mathematically, so numerically speaking, we are just thinking the transformation of a vector in some real space, could be time domain or spatial domain into the frequency domain. And then the, the key factor is the, the phase factor that will be applied to, to move between the rear and then spectral space. So the effect of the discrete ray transform is pretty much everywhere, I would say. So we know about the signal processing and spectroscopy and you know, oil and gas exploration, which really takes a lot of a signal from the uh, shot signals and then try to extract the information about the uh, the the you know, the the, the, uh, the the policy of the space it is uh, exploring, and you know speech and image recognition. And particular case I highlighted here is uh, appears in the condensed matter system where uh, the periodicity of the material shown as the nanotube in this case can be. Uh, exploited to represent the problem solvable instead of infinite degrees of problem. 
that we can actually uh, find the, the, the pro materials properties quickly. Even the disorder system, such as liquid water, will be well represented by periodic uh, uh, Fourier transform. So as summarized, summarized by Demont, that in Fourier transformation is indeed are really one of the uh, key pillars of the high performance computing. And it is one of the oh, uh, seven dwarf of the, the, the Berkeley high performance uh, computing. So what happens with the Fourier transform is rather simple numerically speaking. So we are changing uh, the representation in real space, the spectral space by applying some matrix that contains the phase of the a system we are looking at. So I'm looking at the simple 1D case. And then the computational complexity as known is like a matrix vector multiplication with the order n square, which is quite expensive <laughs> as we do more data to process. So fast transformation is just a fast way to compute the, the discrete Fourier transform using recursive methods well known. So this is a very well known butterfly pictures about the uh, solving uh, fast Fourier transformation using the Cooley the Turkey algorithm. So the, the left is A by A matrix you will be applying to the vector. You know, if we do the na naive computation, you will be multiplying this vector to the, the uh, this matrix to vector. But uh, using the uh, Cooley Turkey algorithm recursive breakup, we are able to do this computation in a scale of n log n, which doesn't seem to be much when you consider a point FFT, but as we move to the much bigger problems, then this will give a huge advantage. So one thing to know, the first about the, the recursive formula reduces the computational complexity. But one thing to note is about how the data is actually being moved from the left to the right. And the arrows are about indicates the how the, computer, the data has to be uh, you know, multiplied and combined to go to the next phase. So obviously we just counting those uh, uh, arrows, you will recognize that there is a lot of data movement. So if we do perform the matrix vector multiplication in a naive sense, it will be also quite bandwidth bound and the memory bandwidth limited case, unless everything is, is in the case. So, uh, either way, we will be encountering the, the, the major part of being the, the memory bandwidth, whether it is the main memory or the cache. So there are many ways to do compute FFT. I mean, this is just the list you will find and then, and I don't <laughs> plan to explain any of those, but all these algorithms are developed to also manage the computational complexity as well as how to optimize the memory or data movement so that you know, the time to solution gets improved. And so how would you generalize this FFT beyond the 1D FFT uh, is uh, shown in this picture. So I'm taking the 3D FFT most commonly used in 3D physics we are serving. And we can express the FFT in three dimensional as a, uh, the <laughs> sequence of a 1D FFT on one direction, X, Z direction, Y direction, and X direction in a sequential manner. So this picture will be showing uh, FFT in one DFFT is the direction of the uh, sort of quote unquote pencil. And we will be performing many of those pencil FFT and then transpose to be able to do the next direction and so on. So there are you know, two main components of the, the computation is of course, the 1D FFT actually doing the uh, butterfly for each uh, pencil direction. And also the other one is that just to be able to prepare the data and then use 1D FFT, typically you will actually explicitly transform the, the data so that we can align on the data to, be per, to perform 1D FFT and so on. So, so it, it is just to ex show how much data movement we are talking in just to doing through the FFT and how to do those things well will be our main uh, issues to get the high performance on any platform. So having 
so discussed it, <laughs> the, the, the very uh, broad and deep world of FFT, at the end of the day, for the application developers, what we have to keep in mind is that we have libraries for FFT, and we will be using it as well as we can to maximize the performance on a given platform. So uh, luckily, there are highly optimized libraries such as MKL FFT, and FFTW library that has been a pioneering work to uh, uh, deliver very high performance FFT. And they all provide highly optimized and one the FFT. Typically, they will factorize, and then you can uh, uh, see what the level of optimization they offer from power of two all the way to 13, 17. So I think typically 13 is uh, on, on many platforms, you will, will be able to use the highly optimized uh, factor up to something like a 13 and 17 sometimes. So if you have a particular problem size that demands a certain prime number factorization, that is the, the new uh, uh, routines we may be able to produce. And based on all this optimized one, the FFT, they also offer a quite optimized and dimensional general FFT, and also the transpose functions that facilitate the, the general three uh, and dimensional FFT. But because of the data distribution and then how you know one can reorganize data such that application can do different things, so the the libraries don't particularly provide the most customized, optimized um, methods of a multidimensional FFT. So in that sense, in many cases, such as the, uh, the uh, electronic structure code I will be using as an example, tend to do do-it-yourself kind of FFT based on the, the building blocks such as 1D FFT and the transpose function and you know, write their own transpose function. So, the, for the rest of the talk, we will be looking at, you know, how, we, what, you know, what do we have to look for and how we are going to use it. Any questions so far? <laughs> All right, so, so given the wide selection of the choices you have, but because of the, really the, how easy it is to pick up the library and then use it, I will focus on FFTW and NKLDFT. So both are provide a really general uh, implementation for one to one to multidimensional FFT. And this is the list of the facility uh, capability they provide. And they all also uh, support both uh, shared memory and node optimized or distributed FFT or multi-node SMT. But in case of a multidimensional FFT, because of the sort of the best scope of the, how the data can be laid out, these library tend to be very general, which means the, the very simple or also straightforward the data distribution is assumed. And then you, if you are lucky enough to be able to use those optimized library, then I think we are good to go. But very often you will be decomposing your FFT to be uh, uh, able to use the components of it. So FFTW, just to summarize, is that the real, uh, they have a two major version of FFT2 and 3, and they have a, some differences that can uh, change uh, how the, the code should be written. And there are some uh, uh, aspects of the optimization that's not commonly available for 2 or 3. But nevertheless, the key point of FFTW in many contexts in, is about their introduction of FFT plan concept, and then also auto-tuning of the uh, auto-tuning feature. So it introduces the, the concept of planning, which means that for a, a, since uh, many applications will be doing the, main, uh, the same kind of FFT over and over again, if we can uh, pre-compute and then uh, also the, uh, prepare the plan such that the, the, the execution is uh, faster. So that plan concept is widely adopted and many drive FFT library will be uh, taking the similar steps, creating the plan and executing FFT and so on. And the MKL at the FT, it, it's a, a inter, uh, 
uh, implementation of FFT, and they have a different API and so uh, uh, and the how actual implementation is done and how it handles the, the parallelism. Uh, but uh, so the uh, but because of it is the uh, uh, developer intent obviously provides the highly optimized uh, FFT over many class of a problem. Another aspect of MKLDFT is it does provide FFTW wrapper, which means that you can, application can leverage the uh, API of FFTW while internally they can use the FFT that is optimized on the particular architecture and particular uh, uh, memory and compute system. So we have a question, um, if you could go back. Uh, yes. For FFTW multi-threading, is it better to use pthreads or OpenMP? <laughs> <laughs> and then the second half of it is, and how does one choose the number of threads for a given transform size? So that's a good question. So uh, my simple answer would be just to use the MKLDFT wrapper of the FFTW, which I will show you how to use it. And then it will be using uh, the particular choice you make. And I don't think there is any big difference at the end of the day, pthread and OpenMP. And the more important factor is, of course, how to choose the number of threads and so on. So that's, I hope, so I cannot give you one answer that fits everything. So it will depend. And then also based on the picture you saw about the FFT. So if, you know, the, the parallelism is given by the choice of the problem size that you have, therefore the, what is will be the optimal number of threads and will be also determined by the uh, size. So uh, unfortunately, I cannot give you the uh, one a good answer from <laughs> uh, that perspective, but uh, 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 FFT threat uh, implementation wise, if you are using MKLDFT, you won't be able to see much of a difference in how the thread is being managed internally in wrapper is not the same as the FFTW. Therefore, the, the, the result will be quite uh, irrelevant. So there are some examples I will show you and then just to give you some ideas what to do. So this is a sort of slide from NKL team about what features of FFT is available in NKL. And I, I mentioned about FFTW interface so that you know, application can just uh, drop in the MKL libraries and pass through the course to the actual uh, uh, optimized library. And the, you know, they also have provided a cluster FFT using the uh, record called the 2D decomposition, meaning that they will divide the problem into slabs and then perform the cluster FFT accordingly. And it, it is a, a well parallelized because of the, to be able to support the many core uh, architecture we have. And the storage format will be quite flexible. And so you know, the, these are the standard uh, the format that the users use. And in case of the very highly customized data distribution, then you know, it will become a sort of DIU type of FFT that you will build your own application specific library. And the key feature nowadays is about the batch support means that instead of performing one FFT at a time, we can provide the, uh, the data uh, structure such that internally FFT can perform multiple FFT. So this can be very powerful, particularly for the small FFT, but you have to do many of those. And in a way the 3D FFT can be expressed as a many 1D FFT and then being able to use that feature will be very critical. And there are many other uh, features we have. And there are some other interesting features you can find out about how you can actually extract more information of what the FFT does through some options. And this will be sent to you and then slide. And then also the websites where the, the latest performance numbers are available. Ah, so let's, get to the point. So uh, I think many of the uh, uh, users are quite familiar with FFTW. So I'm taking the FFTW 3D example, which means that we are going to call one routine that performs 3D FFT for you. And this is a simple example of a 64 
a cube case and I'm going to do four FFTs. So the, the basic uh, uh, structure of FFT library of today can be seen as first create a plane so that we can perform the FFT uh, transformation in the application. And uh, the particular case for the FFTW is that uh, it needs to, we have to create two different plans for forward and backward. And also, depending upon how you are going to perform, is a uh, in and out vectors are identical or versus the in and out are the different kind, uh, different uh, data set. So that will really set how much data will be touched and moved in the application. But you know that, but sometimes you know having extra uh, memory uh, or buffer for in and out will have a, a, a different property. So that's the choice uh, application developers have. And the once you create the plan, then the, 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 the computation becomes quite simple just to perform forward and backward and then clean up. So this is the, 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 uh, the, the creating plan and reusing it over and over again is a quite a breakthrough. And then depending upon how you define FFTW to be optimized in planning stage, you will have many options. In, you know, so sometimes it can take for a long time, but you know, if you are serving one particular type of FFT, FFT over and over again, you will be able to leverage uh, that feature. So MKS3 DFFT have a uh, very similar structure. Okay. Jiangnim, uh, I was just wondering, what do you have a rough estimate of the plan setup time versus the actual um, execution time for the FFT? Uh, so, so in other words, how how much are you saving each each time you execute the same plan? Good question. So let, let, just wait like two minutes or five minutes. <laughs> yes, that's a very important point because uh, very often we want to be able to wrap this 3D FFT as a nice API that manages everything internally. So if we call, plan, and execute, and clean up, what will be the, uh, the consequence of it? That's a very good question, and it will be an important factor to consider in designing your application. So MKL, so going back to the parallel uh, or the similarity between the FFTW and MKL uh, FFTs, they look very similar. And of course, obviously the name of the uh, uh, structures is different than how it is being created, but the features they provide is very similar. The one main difference is that in case of FFT, MKL DFT, you won't be needing uh, forward and backward separately or internally uh, done. And in fact, there is a huge difference between FFTW and NKL in creating the, the plane and how they manage those structures and then you will see the consequences of it. So because of that, designing 3D FFT for your own application should factor in all these things together to make sure that we don't uh, repay the penalty of the creating plane only uh, rarely or only necessary and then try to reuse the optimized plan as much as one can. So this is a FFT wrapper I'm talking about. So many people will be uh, knowing about it. So uh, earlier on, there were some you know, uh, steps you have to take to be able to use it, but kind of recently between 17 and uh, 18, our uh, Intel compiler, uh, Parallel Studio, only thing you have to do is just to include this FFTW. And I'm probably missing the link stage and then I will get back to you with the full link. Uh, uh, no, th there is no link for the case of the shared memory case, but discrete or uh, distributed FFT, cluster FFT will require extra library link. But the, the, the basic step, if we are using FF, MKL wrapper, FFTW wrapper will be just the dropping the include file. That's pretty much all you have to do. So what do we have to do? So exactly, so FFTW have a certain requirement that we have to consider and how you uh, manage the buffer in and out buffer and how one can use it really, really depends on uh, uh, the, the interface you choose. And then, then also, but they also offer something called the, the uh, expert mode, which is described as FFTW execute DFT, which can, uh, which allows you to reuse the plan uh, 
even if the data of buffers or uh, in and out buffers are different. And certainly the cost at the plan creation step is very critical. And it, it is, uh, it's not parallelized, the actual plan creation, which means that you know, slow uh, clock can bite you. So that's where uh, the computation time can be exhausted. So you can save the plan as you know it, but, uh, but certainly you don't want to create the plan frequently if you can avoid it. And how the open MP threads are used is quite uh, important too. So I think that the, the question was really related to that. And you have to create the, the thread environment at the beginning, whether it is P thread and open MP and use it. So uh, I, I don't I have a real uh, case where you know, there is a, some conflict between the P thread and open MP because an application used both at the same time. That's usually not very productive. So, but once you have chosen the a particular thread case, then uh, the, the first thing, I think is how to create the thread environment for FFTW and then reuse it. So this in fact is what you are looking for. So how much cost how much we are going to pay if we do the FFTW planning. So this was taken from a particular code vase and they choose the, the, uh, their own FFT, 3D FFT function to be modular and they separate from the rest of the code. Therefore, it keep creating the plan and destroying as it calls the FFT over and over again. So what you are looking at is the data on Haswell cluster, Cray cluster, and they offer both a uh, standard FFTW library and also LIPSD version of it. What you're looking at is the actually, if you keep calling the, the, the planning, this much is being spent just to creating the plan. So the computation is the dark bar. The two is the FFTW implementation. Clearly you can see that the, the cost of planning is quite substantial. And, and this is the, uh, the, on the right is the number of threads and how, you, so uh, this is the case when all the FFT uh, time on a node should be constant because we are doing a lot of FFT at the same time, dividing the, the node by the number of threads. So the, the thread cost per se is not a problem, but certainly we are paying a lot of, uh, a price just to being able to create it. So, what we what we want to make sure in application is to clearly separate the stage of the initialization of the plan, caching them in, and then keep using it. In fact, Florian, the the first author of this paper, have developed has developed the library so that you can actually manage those plans internally without uh, uh, changing the code through the uh, preloading the library routines and intercept the, the, the plan creation. So such things is possible. So in case of NKL, obviously, so they have, they manage the plan quite differently. So, you know, you can see that the, the performance is better because it's optimized on the Intel platform. Also because of the way the plan is managed has much lower overhead on in particularly in case of Haswell. But however, Planning and creating the plan in NKR is not free either. So this is one case you will see that how much you might be paying if you don't uh, uh, manage the plan carefully. So, and also because of the, uh, uh, the cost in the creating a big data memory, chunk of a memory has a, a, a certain cost. And if you have a small FFT and do it very frequently, it will pay you a lot of penalty. So, one uh, example is that the, the blue bar is read, you know, just to creating the plan as you dip down with FFTW or NKL and then keep using it. Uh, that would be the light blue, but you know, if you could write a very nice you know, FFT module that can manage all these things you know, every time you create. So clearly you will see the big performance uh, difference by keeping the plan and then uh, caching them properly and reusing it versus uh, and so on. And there has been a big change in how MKL actually shares the plan between different uh, 
uh, if you perform the, uh, uh, the same FFT, but in a different in thread. So those are something to consider. But as of today, Paris Studio 17 or 18, the plan, once you're creating the, let's say, serial reason and keep using it, you won't see, you will be getting the performance of the light blue. And then on the right, so you can clearly see the difference between the small FFT versus of already in the very large FFT, the, the double or, or in case eight times bigger FFT you're doing. So in that case, the, the, the cost of a plan doesn't seem to be very high. So it will be all depends on the what kind of FFT and the problem size you are dealing with. So clearly what it shows is the you know, allocation is important and if you can reuse the plan as much as you can, then you will be able to see really pure performance gain in, in general. Let's, I will so, move on. So to we that. have a, a comment on the chat from uh, one attendee uh, who shares that um, for their application, if it's more than six to 12 hours and they use FFTW patient, they can save a lot of time and for their application, if it's less than an hour, then they find using uh, FFTW estimate can be much faster. So I, I, would, I would think this is a function of how much reuse of the plans that there is in that particular app. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so what the plan involves also is, uh, uh, yes, it's one thing to actually find optimized plan and then uh, use this plan uh, throughout the application. And that's, that's important. I think the, the uh, comment is about that. So, so that would be really true. Uh, and, but there is an additional thing is that just being, just the calling any uh, allocation has consequence on, uh, uh, on certain, on many cases, in many cases. So, you know, being able to reuse the, the, in the customized and expert plan is important and also reducing your location as much as you can, you can will be also important. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so I will sort of go to the specific application case using 3D FFT just to bring up the issues you want to consider, given that those are the basic allocation issues, how to do manage the basic building blocks of the FFT library. So I'm going to use a, a class of application, namely plane wave density functional theory on parallel computers. So this is sort of, a, I consider a very seminar paper in parallel computing and also the, the uh, large scale electronic structure calculation captured uh, back in 1992. So they have to do FFT on a quite small machine to the, in today's standards and then doing it as efficiently as possible. And the, the, the whole thing we have to consider in this, doing the 3D FFT is all considered in implementing all these codes I listed. And I'm sure I'm missing a lot of code, but all these codes are really taking advantage of the, the parallel uh, 3D FFT and they use uh, pretty, uh, with the improvement of the, the fundamental 1D FFT and then you know, basic building block optimization in the library, we are able to really push the performance of this code quite a lot. So this is pretty much how the FFT code is being written in a very simple way. So I just wanted to highlight how the FFT is used. So one thing is that we are doing FFT. That was the common factor, and that's why I'm using this application uh, to discuss the, uh, the rest of the talk. Another thing is how and what type of FFT is being used. So you can see that we are calling FFT within a loop. So there uh, is a- John, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you, uh, you, we're only seeing the top half of your head right now. Could you tip your camera? Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Very good. Do you have to, do you <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, it, it's it's okay. It looks good now. <laughs> I, I, I should see what I yes. <laughs> so uh, yes, yeah, so doing FFT is one thing, and then knowing what type of uh, what kind of FFT, what size of FFT is important. So 
in the case of this code, I mean, you can't just give one number. There's a really a wide range of problem. It can go from you know, just the 10 cube versus all the way to 1,000 cube and 10,000, I mean, not quite 10,000, but I would say between 10 to 1,000 is very uh, uh, possible problem. And with that, they also have to solve a lot of those vectors simultaneously. So, and in this case, is typically related to the problem they're solving, namely the number of electrons. And what they have to do is doing a lot of these FFTs. Sometimes in connection with the other type of computation you do, it could be dot product, it could be a matrix vector multiplication. But how it is being used is quite uh, nicely captured in this uh, this picture, uh, this uh, slide. So you will see that you will be really doing FFT in a loop sense, and it could be combined with the rest of the, the code and then do something else. So if it is just FFT alone, then problem is probably very simple. Just to do the FFT on each core or each thread and we are done with it. But obviously that's not the case because we are solving quite large uh, M problem. There are more than a uh, few of them and it can be as large as 10,000. And then how you distribute the data will impact both FFT performance and the rest of the computation. So typically they start, I mean, there are sort of two easy choices. You could distribute the band or namely that each uh, distributed node has a certain number of FFT to do and then keep using it. So I call it band distribution. Uh, uh, we, the, the experts will call it band distribution. The other way is going to be doing FFT across the node and then uh, everybody will have a, a, the, the, the entire uh, copy of M. So original paper I show at the beginning as an introduction had to do bottom FFT distribution because the machines they had at the time didn't have enough memory and the problem that can solve M in this case was very small, you know, 64. So that means that you know there isn't enough parallelism to do to distribute over M, but there are enough parallelism to serve to do the FFT. So the starting point of that paper was here at the time and then for a long time many of FFT uh, many of these codes adopted this so quote unquote FFT distribution and it worked quite well based on MPI. But as we move to the new <laughs> era with the higher plots and then really powerful node, then FFT doing the distributed FFT has a huge penalty and then that can compromise performance. So the other opposite way of doing it will be in taking advantage of FFT. So this is the case where you would have to decide what type of FFT you will do based on the entire application and the architecture you are dealing with. And then of course, you know, the, the, the obvious uh, alternative is also combining those two and how you map out the data, you know, breaking the band into the different columns and the row and if you can stay FFT within a shared memory domain, either NUMA and a socket or a node or a, or a core, you will be able to use highly optimized FFT as well as the uh, better data distribution to solve the other kind of problems. So, so there are sort of back, many background materials just to uh, give you the idea. So going back to the three FFT, so, so you can clearly state different applications will do different things, but basic concept is similar. You will be doing one day FFT uh, followed by transpose and so on. So in case of the uh, distributed FFT, we are talking about the auto kind of this uh, data uh, exchange between this uh, node. So how would you do the optimized with the FFT? Just have to decide what problem you are solving. So in case of this particular class of examples, uh, so, so we can sort of make the boundary. So M could be 10 to 1000. And F550 grid typically range from 10 to 200. I pick some numbers, but I think in you know, the 512 is probably the 
the quite ambitious calculations of today's standard, but you know, it will move on as they try to solve the bigger and bigger problem. With these changes in the problem size they want to solve, certainly it is getting more bandwidth memory, uh, memory bandwidth or network bandwidth than the QK. So being able to contain the communication within the 3D FFT to be uh, less taxing on the memory bandwidth or any kind of bandwidth, uh, the, the bottleneck will be very critical. And with the change of the architecture, such as SIMD architecture and the different kind of cache architecture, FFT itself can be highly optimized by taking advantage of the architectural structure. So you, you will see some of them. And many of these uh, FFTs can be expressed as, as many batched FFTs. You saw the, the simple code uh, example, and we could just make the one gigantic code and the, give to the library to handle the, those batch case. So if you can do that, that will give you a lot of a, a compo, a performance boost. And also because thread is managed internally by the library, there is a less overhead in the, putting those the thread is risen together. The bottom line will be really about how we are going to move data efficiently and how we are going to use optimized transform. And in case of the, the, the distributed 3D FFT, and of course, the how to be able to you know, maximize the overlap between the computation and the communication is critical. So some uh, code already adopted a very interesting pipeline approach so that they can do computation and then transpose on different vectors simultaneously so that they can optimize the performance. So, so these are sort of, I mean, I'm not saying anything new, and we are just, I'm just reminding you what to consider in optimizing your 3D FFT case. So this is the data uh, I can uh, sort of give just to uh, show what I'm talking about. So, so on the systems like Kenya or the, the Xeon, I mean, the, the, the late, uh, the, uh, the, the most recent uh, the platform we have, all node memory bandwidth is so much higher than off nodes. So very rarely you will be benefiting by getting out of the uh, node to perform FFT. So this is sort of the, the, the indication of that. And then how many threads you will be choosing. Again, it will depend on the problem size. But in case of a 128 cube case, it turned out number of, number of threads is not that important. So in this case, I'm showing you how many, uh, uh, the, the total gigaflow when we perform multiple FFT concurrently. So each thread is going to uh, perform a certain number of uh, FFT using a uh, given number of threads. And then on the left, uh, so ideally in that case, the, the flop should be constant if we change the number of threads. And largely, I think you know, we can see that uh, but I mean, obviously there is overhead by uh, doing the fine grain uh, communication within FFT. So uh, what you are looking at is from uh, the, let's say two concurrent FFT versus 32 FFT. It means that each FFT is taking longer when you do the 32 FFT uh, using the same amount of the uh, same node. So, Certainly, there is a, some differences, but the variation is not uh, as great as one expected. And the other thing to note is that in case on KNL, certainly because of the cost of the memory mo data movement, using the hyper threading does help in the case of FFT. But of course, you know you have to take this into account in the context of the full application. So. You know, if you are gaining this much on FFT, does other computation also gain using the multiple thread? That's something to consider. But uh, overall, the number of threads and how you distribute and how many concurrent FFT you do is quite, you know, uh, it's much less of variation. And in, on the right, we are doing very much the same calculation by using the data distribution scheme of uh, distributing FFT or, uh, between the MPI rank and then performing uh, this 
the same number of FFT. So as you can see, so the, the key is that the MPI communication does cost you, particularly for the uh, this size of FFT on KNL, and this is very same on any architecture you will see today. And then the change in, of the hyper-threading is not very great in this case, mainly because it's it's really about the MPI communication. So uh, at this point, we are looking at pretty much the flat uh, profile. It means that from the throughput perspective, you will be able to, you will be pretty much paying the same kind of computational uh, uh, cost. So the choice will be how fast you want the answer to be. So in case of one FFT, means that we are doing you know, one FFT at this rate, that means the time to solution will be faster on the left versus the much higher time to solution. So this is the, the graph you will see. So this is sort of the strong scaling graph you will plot in, uh, in addressing the FFT performance. So starting from a uh, very in the, the long time and then scaling down all the way to uh, uh, doing the, you know, using 32 uh, threads to perform one the FFT of this size. So, so this is this is what you expect, and depending upon your application, you will choose different data distribution and a different way of doing FFT. And now, so that's good. So, but what if I'm not the lucky person that can just use the whatever library offer, and then I can just use it. I think that's the case for the, the electron structure code I introduced at the beginning. So, and in many cases, applications have a very particular need for data structure and you will choose the data structure and also distribution to optimize the entire application. So it's important to be able to balance different parts of the code and that FFT has a certain constraints on the optimal data set, but at the same time, it's one of the very flexible cases that you can manage how to do those data structuring and then uh, distribution. So let's take the 2D example, simplifying the 3D example is how would you do the FFT in a simple way? Typically, you will be doing the 1D FFT in parallel and then transpose so that you can do the second FFT in the same way. So you will be using the same FFT, one the FFT, and you know, inter, in, inter, in, interleave transfer. So one thing to note is, you know, do we actually have to do the transfer? This is a good question. So can libraries such as MKL or FFTW tend to uh, uh, impose certain constraints how the data should lay out? So, you know, that's something to think about. If your application do not require a certain ordering and you can manage the different ordering and packing and unpacking, then there is no need to have this transfer. You know, so it becomes that, you know, reducing data movement becomes quite critical. And this is sort of one way to think about it. So instead of doing explicit 1D transpose and 1D, one can utilize the, the feature provided in the library to perform Instead of a, a strike one FFT this direction, you will be doing the one DFFT over the a strike n uh, uh, kind of data. But the key is that because of the SIMD and optimization of the SIMD on a SIMD machine, that these vectors can be also highly uh, utilize the SIMD capability. Therefore, overall the performance can be quite improved. And the, the, another option would be, you know, you, you say my data have, have to be aligned in this direction versus in this direction, then you can choose quite different type of transfers in the code so that you can actually perform the FFT from uh, here to there without actually doing an exposed data transfers. And it turned out in some case that is a huge gain then if you can take advantage of that and you will get performance. So how would you do that? It's all about the creating plan. And <laughs> they, in the both side, FFTW and NK will give you all sorts of options that you can manipulate the data. So this is one example, how you would implement their, their first uh, the case is just to create the 2D plan to do certain application. 
they reset the number of uh, how many or oh, the size of a batch and then define the, the distance between the vector. And then you will be doing something similar to 1D, but because of the, the, the we want to embed the information about the implicit transpose, you will do a little bit more work. But once you create those plans, then forward and backward execution will be quite straightforward. So FFW has the same knob, same kinds of knobs. And then you, know, you can also use the FFDW wrapper in NKL to uh, achieve the same thing. So this is sort of a data uh, you can uh, see to just to show what the, what then what it means to really uh, optimize the data movement. So let's look at the, the, the so this is the data on the Scarlet uh, platform, but the story is very similar, although you know, what the size dependency is and what the uh, actual speed up with, from the, let's say, pure uh, case, which means that we are doing 52 uh, concurrent FFT using one thread. And if you decide to strong scale, so going to the left corresponds to strong scaling. So we are using more threads to serve one FFT. So it means that we are assuming that you are going to use uh, more nodes to solve the same problem. So, so try to put those things at the same time. So first, you will notice that that you know uh, at at the, the single node or a serial case, there isn't much a big difference. It turned out in this particular case because we can argue that this is a property of the of the cache we we use and how it is blocked. So don't see much of a difference. But if you do, now, now you do 20, half of the FFT by using two threads. So you will see that the performance don't, you know, the total flops didn't change, which implies that we are going to solve this problem but uh, twice faster. Now, uh, what is surprising is when we do do strong scaling, and in this particular case, we are looking at some you know, super, <laughs> super scaling uh, property in this, that we do have a higher flop, which means we, the time to solution is actually greater than the, the strong scaling, simple scaling as, um, rules imply. Another thing to note is by not doing transpose explicitly, but internally managing those data uh, transpose through the uh, optimized library in uh, MKL, you can certainly see the much better performance just to doing the same kind. So if we translate this into the time to solution, when you use 26 more nodes, then you will be clearly seeing that it's like eight, 80 times faster. So there are all these components you can use. So I like to use the word of building block. So if we can put these things together to better use the, uh, and solve your problem better, then your product will be improved. I think I'm, I can close by now. So, so we did uh, uh, go over the FFT capability of, and, and mainly to MKL and then how it is related to the widely used FFTW. The main topic of the talk was about really how to use these FFT libraries that are highly optimized on a given architecture of today. Then you, know, you clearly see that in all these basic components are very important, or location, how to manage the plane, how to create the specialized plane, and also how often we actually allocate the data in and out. So they are, these are very important to one, not just for FFT, but for any application development and computation. So luckily in case of FFT, experts will be in providing you highly optimized FFT. So in a way, uh, on current platforms, computation becomes almost nothing. It becomes all about how to allocate the data and how to move the data. So if you can define the data structure and distribution to enhance the performance of your FFT and leverage the, uh, the uh, building blocks to uh, con and manage your data movement, I think we can have a much more productive uh, use of FFT in your application. So that's the closing of my talk. So thank you for listening.
Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Oh, I see one on the chat. On a tangential note, is there a well-maintained library for fractional Fourier transform? Oh, I'm not familiar with the <laughs> fractional Fourier transform. Is it is it something to do with the wavelet or something, or is it? Well, we'll see if he follows up. <laughs> um, but I, I have a question. Do you have any particular advice for someone who has their code running already on a Xeon and they're moving to KNL and uh, what what maybe should they look at uh, any kind of changes um, that so yeah you mean the particular case of FFT yeah 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 so uh, I think you know the uh, and <laughs> fundamentally my answer is no. <laughs> Because uh, you know, it's a number of core has, that is changed from let's say 40 to 64. That change is not quite, uh, but and and then of course, like but they do have a different characteristic, meaning that particularly bandwidth is different. But in that sense, you know, how you choose MPI and MP open MP threading to optimize the, uh, the, the machine use is different. But fundamentally from the programming perspective, I would say it's really about the parallelism and you know how many parallelism you want to use and <laughs> just to partition mm -hmm. data accordingly. So, so would you that's the zero order. Uh -huh. So would you recommend trying a few variations in benchmarking? Yes, yeah, so, so typically I will just run some in a simple, uh, I, it is a kind of mini app, then you just turn over and then you can clearly see the uh, scaling property. And another thing is that there is a difference between KNL and Skylake, let's say, but also there is a difference in how well the uh, sort of uh, libraries are optimized and that they can vary and different size can behave differently. So very, I mean, I would recommend that just to write a simple code like uh, I, I'm using to show the data and then you can see the characteristic and then also you can tell me that there are certain sizes that a, a library is very poorly optimized. But because of the range you can choose, there is always the way to get around. So yes, I would recommend that just to being able to use the simple code that represent your problem and then see how it scales and what the status of these libraries are on given architecture, and then try to uh, size that up in your full application. So we have some follow-up about the fractional Fourier transform. Uh, it is an operation that's in between identity and full Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. Think of it as a rotation operation. A rotation of zero is identity, and a full 90 degree rotation takes the vector to frequency space. Fractional Fourier transform takes the vector to something in between. Yes. So, so, the, uh, so the, original, the original question now that we have the background is, is there a well-maintained library for doing this fractional transform that you I know am of? Not, I'm not aware of Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay. So I, yeah, so I will answer the, the other question about 512 cube or larger. Uh, yes, I have. And even for that problem size, in case of the, let's say, many FFT case, uh, uh, so 512, uh, I think it's typically uh, the, high, the, the highest flop, total flops within a node. So I, I don't have the data with me, but uh, I think, it, uh, you can sort of extrapolate from uh, the, let me see. Uh, yeah, so this is the case of 128Q, right? So 512 will be somewhere here and then pretty much flat, but the time in you know, the strong scalability will be much better. Uh, so 512, so if you are just to, Doing 512 on a node that uh, uh, 
I think it has plenty of the uh, terrorism. So it really depends on how much and how many nodes you want to use. And then you can pretty much use uh, any combinations on this architecture. So 512 is quite substantially large. So if you are doing only one 512 cube problem, that is quite hard a uh, problem and depends on how far you want to go. So maybe you are thinking using 512 nodes. I think that's quite uh, uh, reasonable, uh, although I don't have the data to uh, support my <laughs> argument. So it, um, take a look at the, the chat. There are, there's uh, some additional to, uh, additional yes. question to um, the, uh, he says, there was a benchmark library called Gearshift, which was released recently, comparing the performance of different libraries. And one interesting thing they showed was that for small transforms, FFTW is faster with planning, but for larger transform, CLFFT is about as fast as FFTW. Uh, this was tested on Haswell. Do you think this can be extended to Xeon Phi? Uh, interesting that CLFFT is the uh, OpenCL version of FFT. So, uh, right. <laughs> Uh, so, right, I we're talking different, data, we're different, yes, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I can, so I I don't think there is any sort of a general property of some of these libraries, and I think depending upon uh, the demand in a way that what uh, typical calculation demands, there will be different levels of optimization. So let's say if you have a very important problem to solve, that it turned out that MKFFT is really tanking, <laughs> then let us know, then we will try to address the uh, data on a given architecture, and it could be a very useful information for the library developers. So, but I, I cannot make a very general statement about which library will be better and so on. So it obviously, ABX 512 optimization is better done in NKL implementation, but there are better, I mean, but the FFTW has been improving. So that is a sort of moving things. Then hopefully we can uh, uh, make a constant improvement over those things. The, I will talk about, uh, yes, yeah, so I think that this is a very important, uh, yes, so, so large scale FFT, so, <laughs> yes, it turned out that at the end of the day, it will be about the MPI, uh, MPI transpose to be able to use many nodes. And clearly, if you are doing uh, all two in a uh, sort of a, uh, there is a limitation uh, with the communication and so on. So there are other things to consider. So if we are sort of doing the all two in a sort of a many, uh, typical blocking way, then communication will really take over our computation. So how to rewrite those transports so that we can really <laughs> uh, paralyze in true sense. So there are some other, some things, some concepts such as the multiple endpoint where we can actually open up more communication channel than MPI uh, rank can deliver because in many cases, the surely open MP or the node gives you a very good performance. But at the same time, reduced number of rank can uh, counteract the improved computation because of the communication. So there are features you can use, uh, and it is certainly expensive. So if you can, as a, optimizing these things will be important than uh, the work to do. 